Hi folks, uh, my name is Jeff Cotts and I'm here today to talk to you about describing da data using frequency tables, frequency distributions, and graphical presentations of those things. If you recognize the PowerPoint slides that you see in this presentation, it's likely that you have this textbook right here, Basic Statistics for Business and Economics by Lind, Marr, Shaw, and Wathen. Let's get right to it. The things we're going to talk about today are frequency tables and how frequency tables get represented using bar charts. We're going to talk about frequency distribution, which is just like a frequency table, although strictly speaking the definition of a frequency table is slightly different. Uh, we're going to talk about relative frequency distributions and how those are represented with pie charts. And then lastly, graphic descriptions of frequency distribution, such as the histogram, the frequency polygon, as well as the cumulative frequency distribution. The data that we're going to be seeing in this presentation is uh, ancillary to this textbook. It comes from the this description that you see here talking about the Applewood Auto Group. Basically, there's 180 records here, each of which indicates a car that was sold over the course of a month. The five uh, variables that get included here are the age of the buyer, the profit that the car was sold for, one of four locations where the car was sold, sometimes called dealerships, uh, the vehicle type, there's five vehicle types, sedans, compacts, hybrids, trucks, and SUVs, and how many previous owners there were. Zero would indicate a new car, one, two, three, four would indicate that there were that many previous owners. Anyway, this is the data that's going to be used for most of the things that get described here. To start, we'll talk about a frequency table. It's a grouping of qualitative data into mutually exclusive classes showing the number of observations in each class. Mutually exclusive means that there's no overlap. If a car got sold at the Kane dealership, for example, it could not also have been sold at the Olean dealership. It can only be sold at one. That makes it mutually exclusive. Like I said, there's 180 records, and we can see here the number of cars that were sold at each location. Strictly speaking, a frequency table is qualitative data. Here, we're simply counting how many cars left each of these lots. Well, qualitative data can be summarized using bar charts. A bar chart is a graph in which the classes, so each of those four different locations, are reported on the horizontal axis. And the class frequencies, or the count, gets reported on the vertical axis. The class frequencies are then proportional to the height of the bars. There's a number of different ways that bar charts can be represented. Uh, we can change the width of the bars, we can change the scaling on the y-axis. I'm about to show you a number of them right now. now. No, this is baseline for all of the next bar charts we're going to see. For example, at the bottom of this one you can see that the uh, the bottom of the y-axis is at zero frequency, which if we go back to the first one is the same. But the top of the y-axis now goes to 200, where before it only went to about 50 there. By doing this, by changing the scale of the y-axis, we can make it look as though there's no difference between them. Because the heights, those relative proportional differences there, aren't very different. Now, that's just by changing the scaling of the axis. Again, as opposed to starting at 0 down here, now we start at 35, and we cap at 55, which is really close to whichever one of these is the mode, or the most common. By changing the axis scaling that way, it makes these differences look really big. Kane looks almost three or four times as much as Olean here, where before it looks like it may only have like a 20% increase over Olean. Much different. Two more things we can do. Notice I've changed the scaling back to the original uh, 0 to 60. We can change the width of the bars. Now this suggests that if you have very wide bars with a, narrow, a very narrow gap between them, the people who look at it will think that it's more flat. In other words, that there are fewer differences because our eye wants to complete the line and we think that that isn't very different. However, again, scaling the same, but now we increase this gap between them. By increasing the gap, we want to make our eyes go up and down as we go across the top of each of these bars, which should emphasize a difference. So we can emphasize a difference, sort of lying with statistics, if you will, by changing the axis. It's actually on this thing. Changing the axis, or by changing the width between the bars. 
Moving on from qualitative data, which gets summarized in a frequency table, we can call a, a frequency distribution an extension of that, which is a grouping of data into mutually exclusive classes showing the number of observations in each class. Excluding the word qualitative from this definition. Not a big deal, except that we're going to need to use quantitative data, which we'll see in just a moment. Excuse me. But as we can see with this one, it's the same data we had before. Frequency table and frequency distribution don't look that different. But let's say we had data. Remember I said I had 180 records and I had within these records, these cars were sold for different profit. The minimum profit is actually $294. The maximum is about 3,292, I think it is. But a big range there. We need to come up with a couple of terms in order to uh, talk about the frequency distribution of quantitative data. Now all those things, three things have to deal with class. The class interval is obtained by subtracting the lower limit of the class from the lower limit of the next class. So the interval here would be uh, 200 subtracted from 600, or 600 subtracted from 1,000. means our interval is 400. Well, 200 to 400, or 200 to 600 is 400. 600 to 1,000 is 400. The interval is 400. And the frequency is the number of observations in each class. And that's over here. We can see that there were eight cars sold for between 200 and 600. And notice the language here. It says up to 600. It does not include the upper bound. That interval from 200 to 600 would not include any car sold for exactly 600. That's the convention that you normally see, and this language is specific to that. But if you don't see that specific language, that's the... Uh, that's what you can expect to see. That's the convention. Lastly, the class midpoint is the point that divides a class into two equal parts. It's the average of the upper and lower class limits. So if we add 200 to 600, we get 800. Divide that by 2, we get 400. And that's the midpoint of all these. We'll see how that's used at the end in the frequency polygon. There's other types of frequency distributions that don't give you just specific counts. We see here our frequency for each of these classes is no different than we talked about before. But if we want to convert a frequency distribution into a relative frequency distribution, uh, we take each of the class frequencies and divide by the total number of observations. So 8 divided by a total of 180 would give a relative frequency of around 4%, 0.044. Now that's the relative frequency of occurrences in this class. It doesn't occur very frequently. However, right here between 1800 and 2200, we see 0.25. That relative frequency occurs most frequently, and it is our modal relative frequency. Relative class frequencies uh, do show a fraction that occur in each class. And it will, the relative frequency will capture the relationship between class total and the total number of observations. So in this case, this is that same qualitative data that we counted before. Again, it doesn't just have to be used for quantitative data that has intervals. We can also do it for qualitative data like this. Relative frequency is the frequency divided, the frequency of a particular class divided by the total. Pie charts are really useful for describing relative frequencies or proportional frequencies. <clears throat> and here I said there were five vehicle types, a total of 180, 72 of which were sold as sedans, which is 40%. You add all these up and you get 100%. A pie, and there's 100% of the pie, and that's what you see over here is 100%. This sedan proportion right here is 40%. Pie charts are used for relative frequencies or proportions. You can manipulate pictures like this the same way that you could manipulate bar charts. For example, you have a two-dimensional version over here. It's only got height and width. Here we've got height and width and depth. And we can rotate it around and, and pull out this wedge right here. This wedge of hybrid indicates only 5%, which is clear here. This is only 5%. But as you change it to three-dimensional, maybe you pull the wedge out a bit, it starts to, in our field of vision, perhaps look like it's a little bigger. Here, it's clear how much smaller the blue is than the green. Uh, I think it's actually about twice as much for trucks than it is for hybrids. 
but you change the angle over here, pull that wedge out a little bit. Now that vacancy right there looks like it might be a little bigger. So we can actually, again, lie with our statistics here and make it look as though hybrids are a larger proportion than they actually are. Once we have our frequency distributions or our relative frequency distributions, we can display those graphically as well. Uh, we can display them not as a bar chart or as a pie chart, but as these three types of charts indicate here. Histograms, frequency polygons, and cumulative frequency distributions. A histogram is a graph in which the classes are marked on the horizontal axis. Classes are marked down there. And the frequencies, again, marked on the vertical axis. The class frequencies are represented by the heights, as frequency generally is. And the bars are shown adjacent to each other. Now, this last part that the bars are adjacent to each other, I've seen histograms in which there's gaps. Sometimes it's a convention for uh, discrete as opposed to continuous levels of measurement. Sometimes it's just whoever made it left the gaps there. Someone's... I mean, you're not a big deal if you put the gaps there, but in this case, where you have continuous data, such as profit, uh, that indicates that there's continuous measurement throughout. In other words, this class interval between 200 and 600, or 600 to 1,000, there's no gap between 600 and 1,000 or anything like that. So I know that this 8, which is the frequency, by the way, your histograms don't have to have those bars labeled, although it's kind of useful here. That number eight on top indicates that there were eight cars sold from between 200 and 600. Histograms are particularly useful with continuous data if you want to get an idea of the shape of the data. In chapter three, we mentioned the empirical rule and say that the empirical rule only applies to normal bell-shaped distributions. If you have continuous data that isn't grouped or doesn't have intervals like this, then you end up with something very jagged and you may not actually have a mode. You may not actually have a shape. It's tough to tell. But if you can put things into intervals like this, you can actually see the shape of this distribution is fairly normal. If you apply the empirical rule to this particular data set, you will find that it holds pretty well for one and two standard deviations, rounded to within a percent. So while this distribution isn't perfectly normal and has a little bit of a negative skew, it appears, it still, the normal distribution still applies. Point being, the usefulness of the histogram is being able to see what your data looks like. Similarly, with the frequency polygon, now you can see already that the axis across the bottom has changed. A frequency polygon is similar to a histogram, uh, allowing us to see the shape again of the distribution. And again, this kind of looks normal here. It consists of line segments connecting the midpoints of the class frequencies. On our histogram across the bottom, those were, as we go back to our vocabulary here, the class intervals or the endpoints. And that's the endpoints of those intervals. But here we have the midpoints indicated here. Connecting the lines between the points, again, the vertical is still the frequency and horizontal is still indicating profit. We can also get the shape. Now there's advantages to each of these. Um, the advantage of the histogram is it, that it depicts each frequency as a height and it lets us know that there's intervals that are capturing things here and we can actually see exactly what those intervals are. Um, but the frequency polygon, as you can see in the second picture down here, allows us to see multiple distributions. So let's say this histogram here like I mentioned at the beginning, indicates one month of sales. If I wanted to compare January and February, it would be really tough to do so with the histogram because all the bars would be overlapping. Sure, you might be able to get away with two, some sort of faded bar system, I don't know. But when it comes to using frequency polygons, overlapping two of them like this, super easy to still interpret. You can see that green is the Whitner Autoplex and the blue is the Fowler Auto Mall. Again, maybe it's the same month, but different distribution outlets were able to compare them both on the same graph. The last type of frequency distribution we're going to discuss is a cumulative frequency distribution. And just as the name implies, it accumulates. So we're just going to add whatever the last 
class frequency was to each of the following classes. So we know that between $200 and $600, there was a frequency count of eight. Well, there was nothing before that, so the cumulative frequency is still eight there. But in this next interval, between 600 and 1,000, we see that there are 11 cars sold for that amount. So up to 1,000 would be 8 plus 11, up to 1,000. In other words, 19 cars were sold for less than $1,000. Note, I didn't say less than or equal to or up to and including $1,000 because the convention we established, along with the language that you see here, denotes that we don't include the upper bound. Up to 1,400 would be 42 as a count. We can also then convert these cumulative frequencies, which total you can see here, up to 180. We can also convert those into relative cumulative frequencies. Percents. We can say, as you can see here, the on the vertical axis over here, percent of vehicles sold. Now this is the actual frequency, the number of vehicles sold, but this is the percent. So now I can use this green line here, which are, is our cumulative frequency distribution. Starting at this point right here, this point indicates that no vehicles have been sold for less than 200. Now this dot here, we know from this table, indicates that eight have been sold for up to six hundred dollars and that's that frequency here and percentage wise eight out of 180 is around four percent up to 1000 is eight plus eleven or 19 and that's what this dot indicates up to 1000 19 uh, 19 out of 18 or i'm sorry 19 out of 180 is somewhere around 11 percent and we can find that out by tracing that over here. And that's what these other red lines and these blue lines indicate. I can follow them in multiple directions. For example, if I wanted to know uh, 60 vehicles were sold for less than what price, I go over to 60 over here, find out where it intersects my cumulative frequency distribution, drop down, and that looks like it's somewhere around 1,600. So I could say that 60 vehicles were sold for less than 60, 1600, 16 ve 60 vehicles were sold for less than 1600. Note that we're doing some interpolation here because we're sort of connecting these two points, but given that those intervals were constructed appropriately and our data is sufficiently normal, we can get away with a lot of those types of things. Uh, second, we can start with some profit at the bottom and say, oh, this is about 1950, maybe $2,000. We go up where it intersects the curve, and then we go across here and we say, oh, uh, $1,950 is the price at which about 55%, uh, just over 50%. So right around the median, actually. Uh, so $1,950 is the value at which less than 55% 55, 55 of the cars were sold for less than 1950. We can also come here and say, oh, start at 75%. 75% intersects here, we drop down to about 2300. We could say 75% of the cars were sold for less than $2,300. So we can start at either, either this horizontal axis where the number of vehicles is, we can start at this we can start at this vertical axis where the number of vehicles are. We can start at this vertical axis where the percent of vehicles is sold. We can go at the horizontal axis where the profit is. And we find out where it intersects our cumulative frequency distribution. And then go out to any of the other axes to figure out exactly how that translates to the rest of our data. The things we cover today. Frequency tables uh, and bar charts and how bar charts are used to represent frequency tables. Frequency distributions and how relative frequency distributions and graphs such as pie graphs are used to represent relative frequency distributions, as well as graphic depictions of histograms, frequency polygons, cumulative frequency distributions, and how all of those are used to represent frequency distributions. Hope you learned something today. Stick around if there's anything else you want to know.